been in a, we've been in this series called um, the Life and Times of Jesus, and we're going to continue in that today. And really, my goal in this series uh, simply is just to help people to understand the world that Jesus walked into, because we're all 21st century Americans, right? It's the year 2018, and so for a lot of us. We just don't understand a lot of what's going on in the Bible, and that's not our fault. We live in, the two, in 2018, but we don't understand some of the symbolism. We don't understand what was like going on with the Romans. We don't understand uh, some of the different covenants and what things meant to the Jews, etc. And there's just so many things that we don't uh, quite fully grasp yet that <clears throat> I, what my goal in this series is to help people better fully grasp some of those things, but make it really applicable. Make it really applicable to our lives because as we can really see what's going on, we're going to have a whole lot better understanding and then be able to take and understand and know God better, see God better, and then see who he's made us to be better and then uh, relate to him better. And so today is actually going to piggyback on what we talked about uh, last week. Last week we talked about um, a time of transition. Which, again, I just thought, that's funny, God, you gave me that title right in the middle of a transition in the name, and are we Karis, are we Grace Life Church? But um, Jesus was a transitional person. Uh, many people, um, you know, when we, when we read our Bibles or we open up our Bibles to Matthew, there's this page before Matthew that says, the New Testament of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so most people think that that's actually when the New Testament or the New Covenant or the New Contract starts. And that is not when the New Testament or the New Covenant or the New Contract, I like the word contract because I think we understand what, the, what a contract is in the year 2018. That's not when the New Contract starts. The New Contract didn't start when Jesus was born. It actually started when Jesus was died and resurrected. Because for 33 years, Jesus ministered to people that were under an old covenant, under the old contract, the law of Moses. And they had to relate to, 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 to God based on the law of Moses. And, and we made some applications um, last week when we looked at a, a scripture. It's well-known scripture. Matthew 6.15 where it says that uh, Jesus said that if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. Your Father in heaven is not going to forgive you if you don't forgive. And where that, it, that brings a lot of confusion for a lot of people because then we also cite this other verse where it's uh, by faith through grace, right? It's all God's grace. We're not saved by works. We're saved by his grace. But when, I, when we say that, but then when Jesus says, if you don't forgive, you're not going to be forgiven, that sounds like a work to me. So then that, because I, I think when I read the Bible, I have to ask this question, God, are you schizophrenic? And that is a reasonable question. It's, it's okay to read the Bible and ask questions. God really likes it when you read the Bible and ask questions. It'll, it'll help you get understanding. It'll, he, he's not scared of your questions. And, and so what we looked at is, for them, what Jesus said, that was true. If you don't forgive, you're not going to be forgiven. Your Father in heaven won't forgive you because they were under the law. And under the law, you had to do everything perfect in order to receive the blessings of God. But now under the new and better covenant, established on better promises, it's about us believing in Jesus and that he did everything perfect, and we get credit for everything that he did simply by putting our faith in the finished work of Jesus. And that's how that harmonizes. So now, you don't have to forgive in order to be forgiven. You should. <laughs> It'll help you. Not forgiving people, that's like drinking poison and expecting them to die. It's, you need to forgive people. That was, I, I deserved a better amen. That was really, that's a better point than... It is. It will, it'll put bitterness and anger and all sorts of stuff in your heart. Um, and so you need to forgive. And, and to go on and establish that further, then there's a scripture over in Ephesians 4.29 where uh, Paul wrote, and Paul wrote to Christians, right? Paul didn't write to unbelievers. He's writing to the church or to believers. And Paul said, because you have been forgiven, now you forgive. You're not forgiving to get forgiven. You are forgiven. And since you've been forgiven, you go ahead and forgive, and you walk in newness of life. And so we talked about that for a little bit, and then we talked about the temple and why Jesus prophesied the destruction of the temple. And that was, um, that was I had several people say to me that that was really profound, that they never understood that. And we talked about where Jesus was prophesying to, to, his, uh, to the 12 in the year 30 about the destruction of the temple and what that meant, and that it was going to happen in one generation. And it happened in one generation. The temple was destroyed in the year 70 A.D. And Jesus said, when you see the abomination 
of desolation, he basically said, that's going to put faith in your heart. You're going to know that what I'm telling you is true. And so we talked about what the abomination is. And what the abomination is, or what it was at that time, was that after Jesus hung on a cross, and all of our sins are paid for past, present, and future tense because of what Jesus has done, that the Jews still went in and offered temple sacrifices for one generation, 40 years after Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. And that was an abomination to God. Temple sacrifice was the best thing going for a season. That was the best thing you could do. That was the only way you could atone for your sin. If it would have been good enough, God would have never sent Jesus. There would have been no need. It was never good enough. And so for them to continue to do that, it really was an abomination. And then we talked about how does that, how do we relate to that? And so we looked at things like when you feel guilty after you sin, that's an abomination. Jesus paid for your guilt. He paid for your shame. When you feel like you can't come to church because you sin, that's an abomination to God. Because you have the shame and the guilt that you're feeling. You're supposed to, in the middle of sinning, be able to go just straight to the house of God. You're, you're supposed to be in the middle of sin, and after you get done, just go pray to God like you're innocent, because you really are innocent. And to say that you're not, that's an abomination. That's not okay. Now, God loves you in the midst of you not realizing everything that he's done for you, but he really wants you to understand how forgiven you truly are, and that God has forgiven all your sin, past, present, and future. Your sin is not an issue with God. It's the question is, are you believing in Jesus and in everything that we we walk in. And so that's what we talked about last week for review. And so today I'm going to piggyback on that. We're going to talk about walking in newness of life. How do we actually walk out the Christian life? Because I think most people's experience is I'm a believer and I, I do well, but then I don't do well. And I can't seem to live the way, what the Word says. I can't seem to live the way I want to live. Right? Is that a lot of people in here? Yeah, I think that's all of us to a measure, and I want to help you walk that out and learn how to actually live the new life. And so, but <clears throat> turn over to John chapter 12, verse 24, and we're going to look, we're going to start in one scripture. We're going to spend most of our time today in Corinthians, but I want to set you up first, and I am setting you up. And I apologize for the heat. Um, if, if you, you don't like this heat, please get born again, because this is what hell feels like. <laughs> no, they're working on it. It'll cut on. I think we'll have it cooler next week. We don't control the heat from the school. That gets, that gets, uh, controlled from the county, so it should be cooler next week. So, but John chapter 12 Verse 24, this is what I call one of these locator scriptures. This scripture will locate you uh, or where you are in your relationship with God, with how you see God and how you think he sees you. So let me, let me read this uh, for you, and, and then I want to describe how most people interpret this scripture. Verse 24, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So here's how most people read that verse. If I'll die to myself, the more I can die to me, then the more grain, the more fruit, the more I'm going to be able to produce in my life, the more God's going to be able to, to flow through me. It's got to be none of me, and it's all about you, God, and I've just got to die to myself. And so basically, they put the pressure of change on themselves. And if you, that's how you see that verse, and most people I've ever talked to read that verse. I've heard some tremendous sermons taught on that verse that way. The problem is that's just not the truth. And I'm going to show that to you in just a second. There is some good application. Yes, we do want to give all of our lives and heart to Jesus, but it's always a response out of what he's already done for us. So look at verse 23. I want to just, I want to show you this. Uh, verse 23, but Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So who's the subject of that sentence? Jesus. He's the one that, that is talking about he's going to the cross and going to be glorified. And then verse 24, he says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. He's talking about himself. He ain't talking about us dying. He's talking about him dying. 
See, Jesus was the son of God, but he became a man so men could believe in God and become sons of God. When any time you plant a seed into the ground, the seed planted will produce a crop similar to that seed. When I plant a tomato seed, I'm going to grow up tomatoes. Jesus had to die and be resurrected in order for us to be like him. And that is literally what he is saying in that verse. So it's not about us dying. It's about understanding how, what he's done for us. And then when you do that, for a lot of people, what I've seen is that shifts the way they see God. It's not about me trying hard to be right with God. It's he has already, he's done everything. And something on the inside, the grace of God, shifts your heart to be able to receive from him more clearly. And now you begin to walk in newness of life. And it's an effortless change instead of trying to die all day long. That's, that's miserable. That is not the God life that God has called us to. Another passage, you don't have to turn here, Matthew 13, 44 through 49. It'll, it'll show you, uh, again, where you are. It's some parables. You can read it later. Just write it down and read it later. But where Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And if a man found it and sold all that he had. And then the next verse he goes on to talk about the pearl of great price. And that a man sold all that he had to get this pearl of great price. And most people read that and they think, we're the one that's selling all we have to get the pearl of great price. We're the one selling all we have to buy this great treasure in the field. But if you go on to read all of those verses down to verse 49, it'll actually show you that it's talking about God. God, we're the treasure that God went to buy. Is that different? Read it later. I'm not even going to explain it to you. Just read it later. Read it down to verse 49. That is actually what it meant. It's not about us trying real hard to change. It's about understanding how much God loves us and how much he wanted to get us. And so he is the, the burden of the relationship to produce change is on him. It's not on us. And again, let me, let me say it this way. The value of something... The price of something is determined by the price someone is willing to pay for it. You could take my house and put it on Wrightsville Beach. All of a sudden, it becomes a million-dollar property. Praise God. I I would sell it to you for a million dollars right now in Winston-Salem. I really would. If make me an offer, we can talk. Why won't won't you pay a million dollars for my house in Winston-Salem? The value's not there. You don't value it that much, so you aren't going to pay for that. But if at the beach, people would pay well over a million dollars. See, the value of something is determined by how much someone's willing to pay for it. God paid Jesus for you. How valuable are you? Amen? And that's the difference really between grace-based thinking versus law-based thinking. Grace-based thinking is all about what God has already done for me. Law-based thinking is what I have to to do. So go over to 2 Corinthians. I want to kind of look at how to work this out. Now, how do I actually produce change? So I want you to think about an area, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, an area you're trying to change in, but you're feeling some frustration that it's just a habit or an addiction you can't, yet can't quit or, or something you've been trying to get started, but it just seems like you start and fail and, uh, and just can't get there. I want you to take a look at that or think about that as we, we go through this. Second so Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Powerful, powerful passages of Scripture here. Verse 16, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. A veil is simply, a, it's a curtain or it's a covering. That's all a, that's all a veil is. It's a curtain or it's a covering. Verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. But we all with unveiled or uncovered face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from the glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. I want to look at verse 18, then we're going to come back and pick apart verse 16 a little bit. But it says right here that we all with an unveiled, uncovered face look into a behold uh, as in a mirror the glory of the Lord when I look into a mirror what do I see I see me when I behold the glory of God it's like what he's saying is it's like looking into a mirror when I behold the glory of God who is Jesus or Christ in me I'm actually seeing myself if I can remove the uncovering if I can remove the cover I should say uncover my face where I could clearly see Jesus 
I'm actually going to clearly see me because I was remade in his image spiritually. One-third of our salvation is complete. Spiritually, the minute you ask Jesus into your life, the Holy Spirit literally moves on the inside of you. You become one spirit with God. The rest of your Christian life is really working out your salvation, beginning to change the way you think, the way you behave, the way you, the way you act, the way you talk. And that, that is a process from where we go from glory to glory. But there's a part of you that's actually already been changed. It is one spirit with the Lord Jesus. You can look that up, 1 Corinthians six 17. We've already been changed. And so when I see God clearly, I actually see myself. And as I see him, I change as by the spirit of the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit doing something that I can't quite explain. But as I see God, that I actually, the spirit does it for me. And I begin to, my, my walk begins to change. My talk begins to change. I actually begin kinder um, without even trying. There is, there's nowhere in the scripture where it says I need to just go confess and try to be kind and do all these things to try. That, that'll actually put you into bondage. Verse 16. Let's, let's look at this. I want to back up to verse 16, it says, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away or the covering or the curtain is taken away when I turn to the Lord. So I think a good question to ask, what is this veil? What is this covering? What is this curtain? Because if I don't know what the curtain is, it's, I might be hindered in my ability to turn to the Lord. So I need to ask this question. Here, <clears throat> here's what most people, and again, because I counsel, I meet with a lot of people, I deal with a lot of people and have just been around for a long time, what most people define the veil is, is they define the veil as sin. That's the way that is usually taught. When I can get rid of all of my sin and I turn to the Lord, then I'm going to see him more clearly. That is not what the veil is. And actually, you trying to turn from sin to see Jesus more clearly, you're going to add another veil. You'll add another curtain. You'll make it get worse. I'm going to show you this. Look at verse 13. It got quiet as a mouse when I said that. <laughs> this really is true. I'm not making this up. This is that's why it's called the gospel. It's too good to be true news. It just doesn't sound. It's just too good to be true. But it really is true. Verse 13. Unlike Moses, who put a veil, put a covering over his face, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. So this is talking about when Moses is on Sinai and he gets the Ten Commandments. And he gets the Ten Commandments, the glory of God's all over him. And so he had to actually put a covering on his face because the the children of Israel couldn't see him clearly because of of all the glory that was on him. And and so he he had to deal with that, and that's what he did. And again, notice it said the end of what was passing away. See, the law was already passing away when it was given to Moses. It began to, that glory that was there on that, which was the best glory there was for a season, was already beginning to pass away because there was coming a time where there was going to be a new and a better glory, which is Jesus, that will last forever. Verse 14, but their minds, talk about the children of Israel, they were blinded. For until this day, the same veil, the same covering remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant or the Old Contract. Because the veil is taken away, the covering is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses, who's Moses? The law, the Ten Commandments, the 613 other things that you had to do. Then you go on into the time of the Pharisees, you had 613 other things. Then they came up with all these extra abolitions of things you couldn't do and other things you needed to do. It added another 500 things. By the time of Jesus, the Pharisees had 1,100 extra requirements on the Ten Commandments. That stresses me out. Good God. <laughs> All of that. But even to this day when the law is read, when Moses is read, a veil lies, a covering lies on your heart. And the the point of the law, it's not that the Ten Commandments were bad, they were good, but what they do is they actually reinforce self-effort. Because I'm trying to get right in my strength in order to be right with God. And so ultimately, I have to do right. I, in some measure, have to become my own savior. That would be great if I could save me. The problem is I can't save me. You can't save you. And so every time we try to turn from our sin and say, I can't look at the 
pornography and come to church. I've got to get all that out so I can come to church. I've got to get all that out so I can pray. Or I, I yelled at my kids and it's like, nah, I'm not right. Or, or I had a, a covetous thought and I can't do that and then see Jesus clearly. Now I'm, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm reinforcing self-effort. And that's actually going to put me into a deeper bondage than, than I was already in. See, again, the law, it, it is not your, your friend. It was 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty six says the, strength, the sting of sin is death. The strength of sin is the law. The strength of sin is lying, uh, trying hard. Let me give a natural example. I used, to, um, I used to, before I got married, I played golf, and then I got married. And <laughs> started having kids, and I, I decided my gift to the game of golf had to go away because... It's just hard to find people that can just barely break 100 on their best day. And so, I'm teasing. But I was, I was okay, I could break 100 on a really, really good day. But one of the amazing things about me when I would play golf, I would usually, when I was on the tee, I would slice the ball. So the ball would go straight and then kind of go off to the right a little bit. Uh, which is how most beginning or intermediate golfers, that's what they do. And so for 17 holes in a row, that's how I drive the ball. It kind of starts out straight and then kind of veers off to the right. Get me up to hole number 18. We got water over here to the left. Like a magnet, <laughs> my ball could find the water on the left. It was, ama- it was supernatural the way that would happen. But here's what, and, and I'm not the only person. Anybody that's ever played golf in here, you know what that's like. Or, or, or another sport. You know what that's like. And usually what happens is we see this water over here on 18 that way, and I'm like, I can't hit the ball over there. I do not want to hit the ball over there. So I start thinking, don't hit the ball over there. As a matter of fact, I'm going to aim a little bit right. I'm going to tee off right. I'm not going to be straight. I'm going to be over here to the right. I'm going to make sure the ball doesn't go over there. Where's my focus? Is it on the fairway where I need to hit the ball, or is it on the water? And consistently, all of a sudden, I'm duck hooking the ball. Golfers will bring in, professional golfers will actually bring in sports psychologists to teach them about visualization, to begin to visualize the fairway or visualize the green or whatever they're trying to say. And what they've actually done is they've picked up on a Christian concept and just, they call it visualization, but that's actually what this is talking about here in in 1 Corinthians 3.18. Because when I clearly see Jesus, I can't think of sin. Again, I don't want anybody in here to, to think what I'm saying about sin, that it sin's, sin's okay. Sin is not okay. It's never okay. All right? This is not a message to make people feel like, mm, I'm not going to live any way I want at all. Sin will take you further than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay, and it'll keep you longer than you want to stay. Do not. This is not a license for that. This is for people that are trying to sin. They're trying to live moral, and it's like, well, how do I keep falling into this failure? Well, it's again, as I clearly behold Jesus the same way I would clearly behold that fairway, and I put all my focus there, I don't think of the water. When I clearly behold Jesus, I don't think of sin. There was a season in my life where that was the way I related to God because I was taught the whole goal of salvation is after you get saved, you've got to get all the sin out. I was very sin conscious. And, all, and it made me sin more because all I'm trying to do is try not to sin. Well, guess what I'm thinking about all day long? When God began to show me these things, now all of a sudden my focus is on Jesus and I actually live holy or not trying to live holy by just putting all of my focus on Jesus and how much he loves me and then me loving him and then doing what he wants to do. Going back to verse 6, and then we're going to look at a real life example of this in the ministry of Jesus, but go back to verse 6 and show you a couple other things here. And it says... <clears throat> Again, Paul talking. Who has made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Trying real hard to be holy, that's actually going to kill you. The law will kill you, but the Spirit of God will give you, it'll breathe life into you. And you get to be able to change without even trying to live holy. Verse 7, for if the ministry of death, talk about the Ten Commandments, written and engraving on stones, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance or his face, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious. And again, there is a glory on the Old Testament. There is a glory on self-effort, right? Because when we try hard, sometimes we do good. 
And that actually reinforces self-effort. And that could be an ultimately major deception. Because there are times we try hard, do good, and we actually get the right results. And it's like Pavlov's dog, right? The, the ring the bell and the dog comes running for food or water or whatever. And it actually, when I try hard and I do good, it actually reinforces and strengthens me. And the bad part is it decreases my dependency on God, which is, which is not good because ultimately it's setting me up for failure. But he calls the Ten Commandments, he calls it a ministry of death. And again, it was the best thing going for a time under the ministry of Moses. Verse 9, For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. So as great as the Ten Commandments, the glory of Jesus is that much more. Now let's look at a real world uh, example as I start to close. Go over to John chapter 8. That's a well-known story. Talk about the woman caught in adultery. It's John chapter 8, verse 10. You guys, you guys know what's been going on here. Uh, the Pharisees, they bring this woman who's been caught in adultery to Jesus... And they say, what do you say, Lord? What, what, what do you say, Jesus? What should we do with her? Do we, Moses said we, she should die. He said adultery, that's punishable, die death. So do we kill her or do we let her go? What do you say? And you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And so they all walk away from the oldest to the youngest. And so let's pick back up in verse 10. And let's look at how Jesus begins to deal and minister to this woman. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? See, Jesus got rid of the law. He got rid of the Pharisees who were the keepers of the law. He had to separate them from her so he could be alone with her. And I really felt like as I was praying about this this week, I, I felt like, uh, and, and I don't say this lightly, I mean this when I say this, this is, I felt like God impressed on me that there's some people here that he is needing to get you to separate self-effort. You're trying to change some things in your life and your strength and you think that's good and you're trying to depend on you plus Jesus and he is telling you, you have got to separate all of that away from you so you can deal clearly, directly with Jesus. And notice when he raised, her, uh, uh, raised himself up, she was looking at him in the face. How are we changed? By beholding the glory of the Lord who is Jesus Christ. As we clearly look him in the face and we see him and we see ourselves in him, we are changed by the spirit of the Lord. We are changed without trying. And this, is, this part's Brianology. I'm not saying this is right. But I really believe she began to, when she saw the, lo, lo, the love of God and the face of love looking at him, she saw herself in him. She saw him looking at her, but she saw herself. She saw who she was truly made to be. Then verse 11, he said, she, or she said, no one, Lord, no one's condemned me. And then he looked at her and he said, you go and sin no more. Didn't say, if you do this, or if you do sin, I'm going to condemn you. Or if you do sin, you're judged. Or He didn't do all, he just said, he just spoke the truth. And he said, you go and sin no more. Jesus, uh, in the one of the most powerful passages of Scripture in the Bible is Mark chapter 4. I love that, that Scripture because it talks about how the whole kingdom works, how the entire kingdom of God works. And it works on the principle of a seed. Jesus talked about the, the, the principle of a seed, and it's the seed planted that produces a crop. And it, he compared the Word of God to a seed, and that the seed will produce after its own kind. And all we have to do is literally plant the seed of the word of God in our heart and we plant the seed of the word in our God in our heart we will change without even trying it doesn't the only thing we have to do is receive the word as we'll receive the word as we'll spend time and receive Jesus and again let me be, be very clear when I say this it's important to receive it from here 
But you can actually use this and beat yourself up with this. The Pharisees were using this to beat the woman up. Anytime you feel beat up by reading the Bible, you haven't read it right. Jesus wasn't reading it to you. The Holy Spirit wasn't reading it to you. You weren't reading it right. And so you need to ask because you should never feel condemned. Because she did wrong. And he said, go and sin no more. But he didn't condemn her. He spoke life to her. He didn't say, if you go sin again, I'm coming against you. God's going to be mad at you. He just said, go sin no more. There's nothing recorded about her ever sinning again. Back to my point about the seed. The only thing that we need in order for a seed to, to produce is for that seed to get in the soil and take root. Right When the seed takes root in the soil and my tomato seed takes root, there's an entire crop of tomatoes that are grown up, that are produced naturally. And it's not the seed isn't in there trying hard. It's just the nature of the seed to produce after itself. The ground isn't even trying hard. It's just you put the seed in and it grows. When you plant the Word of God in you, it grows. The only thing we have to do is receive it clearly in our hearts. And it's amazing when Paul, when he was writing to Christians in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, in, the, in the 14th through 19th verses, he's just praying this amazing prayer of love over the church at Ephesus. And he's talking to them about receiving the love of God, the height, the depth, the length, the width of the love of God. That's four dimensions. There's nothing that you're looking at in this room right now that's, three, uh, that's four dimensions. Anything you see in here is three dimensions. I don't know what that means other than the love of God's out of this world. It's nothing that we can put in our own box to, to understand. It's so beyond. But he, he, he says that you be rooted right in the middle of all that. He says you be rooted and grounded in love. Specifically in an unconditional love is what that word is. It's the Greek word agape, which means unconditional love. That you are rooted and grounded in love. That your heart is rooted and grounded in love. And when you begin to let your heart be rooted and grounded in the unconditional love of God, the seed of the truth, when it gets planted, it will produce. Your heart is good soil at that point. It's easy to receive the word of God. And it will produce without you even trying. You took the truth and you because you're not condemning yourself anymore. You're not hearing, you're not hearing, you have to change. Because it's you, this is who you really are. This is who you were made to be. This is what your purpose is. This is what your destiny is. And you've got all of the ability. I believe in you because I've moved on the inside of you to change you. Amen.